I'm getting levels up to just about 0.5 at most on the reader. Is that good enough? Uh, on Audacity. Uh, I mean, sure. Let's let's go with yes. We can boost it later. Yeah, what you did with my voice was great. You made it really sound non-terrible. I have the technology. I can rebuild your voice. Shall we cast? Yeah, let's cast. Let's do the free one. Hello and welcome to Atypical, the podcast. It's a podcast where we will be discussing and exploring life from a more atypical perspective. My name is Simon, he, there, your host, and I am joined by three friends to discuss a theory of the mind and empathy. With me are Marianne. Hello, everyone. Matt. Hello, good evening, everybody. And joining us this week is... Me, the one who's going to talk over and interrupt all of Simon's attempts to introduce this. Hello, everyone. I'm so looking forward to editing this. Um, This is obviously our second episode. We started in episode one talking about autism acceptance because uh, April is Autism Acceptance Month. And we've got so many more brilliant episodes planned looking at a whole range of things from a more neurodivergent point of view. And that could be everything from policing of of neurodivergent people uh, and interactions within our communities healthcare, education, who's trying to do what and where, and generally the latest research changes and hopefully good news and interesting stories uh, that we plan to bring you in the next few months. We want to get guests in to tell us about what they do and how their neurodivergent behaviours have helped them to achieve brilliant things in their own lives. And frankly, it's, it's really exciting to me and I hope to everyone else, uh, all of the various things we've got coming up. Anyway, Let's dive into this week, the murky world of theory of the mind. So, first of all, we've done that very ADHD thing, and we've read up on this a lot. By which, by, by which we mean, of course, Simon has done that very ADHD thing, and we've all turned up and had a series of lovely notes in front of us, and went, "Oh, thank you, Simon, for doing all that." You're 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 giving away all the mystique. It's it, I, I'm I'm not sure I like this uh, uh, this mysterious person. I don't uh, I don't know. Anyway, um, so we we've gone and done a bunch of research, and so between that and and indeed our own lived experiences, one or two people actually who have contacted us since uh, episode one, which is absolutely brilliant. I'm so pleased that we've got that interaction already. Um, So there is a theory which has pervaded psychology for quite a long time that autistic people do not have a theory of mind. Now, a theory of mind is at its very basis uh, saying that autistic people fail to understand that other people have a mind or that we ourselves have a mind. And this assertion, which has sat within psychology for 30 or 40 years, has led to some enormous damage to neurodivergent people. Uh, it, I think it's quite quite a disservice to us uh, and is frankly wrong. Um, but what what do you all think? Um, yeah, I, was, I find this quite interesting, actually, because um, I think that maybe what they've tried to study is probably children more so than adults. And maybe they've sort of seen that some autistic people might develop that slowly or more slowly than some neurotypical people or something like that. And they've probably gone and blanket termed it a bit too much because I think where our issues sometimes lie um, might be with people's intentions and reading those not necessarily thinking that people don't have their own minds and don't have their own thoughts so we're probably very much aware that each person has their own thoughts and feelings but we might not really know what they are because they might subtly communicate it by wiggling their left finger or what other non-verbal communication they rely on rather than saying I am feeling this because this so I think Mm. there's a lot of like a lost in translation thing what do you think Matt so um I'm not exactly sure it's quite a bit of a new theory to me what do I do I know what other people are thinking no I don't I can't read anything from what they say and there was a. It's back to the work thing about if you sit in a meeting with your legs open, what does that mean, and and the, and the connotations that that means. So I've never understood body language or 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 any of those secret signs that society yeah. wants. So I never really know where I am with conversations. That seems perfectly reasonable. What do you think, unnamed person? 
I think that perhaps links back to how much the way that people think about theory of mind or the way that people think about what other people are thinking, what other people know, which is what all this kind of brings in, is actually quite culturally specific. I'm sure we've all been to another country at some point and there's obviously a lot going on or like a very different cultural context and there can be a lot going on, but your ability to predict what someone's going to do, how they're going to act is very limited. You don't have much context to put things into. And I think the risk with something like theory of mind is that being autistic can quite often feel like you're you're very often in a context where you're out of your depth. You very often don't have much kind of culturally or knowledge-wise to go on to understand other people's actions. And so it can look like you don't understand other people's minds, whereas really what's happening is that people who do, quote-unquote, understand other people's minds just have a lot of cultural assumptions and assum- like rules of thumb that they're going on about what other people are thinking and, and responding to. That if you took them into another country with a very different cultural background would be completely useless to them as well. I think it's a really good point, actually, is there's a cultural aspect to all of this. So I'm going to quote something now. So uh, brace yourselves. It is the Encyclopedia of Neuropsychological Disorders. Please, I'm, I've got a finger over, the, over the, the bleep button. So allow me to quote. Most of us have a theory of mind in that we can guess what others are thinking and how that might differ from what we are thinking. Those with autism can be thought of as mind blind in that they cannot imagine what others might be thinking or even that others are thinking. To them, it would be like looking at the headlights of a car to determine why the car just did what it did or what information it is trying to convey to us. So first, screw them. And second, it's kind of weird to have a headlight analogy, but not mean getting run over. They're not normally references to headlights in this kind of thing about being a rabbit caught in headlights. Um, I think, yeah, it, 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 oh, it does. Uh, it does feel like a difficult analogy for them to have used, doesn't it? Oh, sorry, uh, Marianne. Yeah, this um, sort of a strange one here because have they basically implied that we think other people are not autonomous and don't have thoughts? I think a lot of the autistic people I've met, as just one of them myself um of course we know other humans exist and have their own thoughts so it does seem quite ridiculous but again are they looking at very small children for this and then blanket approaching it to adults or something it's yeah i don't know where they're well i think we'll up. we'll definitely be coming to that very shortly i think because i mean it's really rather awful isn't it like, yeah this, of course this, this is we're a quote not from... selfish like what they think that we are well we try not to be i'm sure yeah. So anyway, so so that quote was from the Encyclopedia of Neuropsychological Disorders. Uh, I'm going to argue that we don't necessarily have neuropsychological disorder, but hey ho. Uh, and that was published within the last ten years, so it, it's not exactly a, oh. a, a you know unnew. <laughs> but I did find during I thought you were going to say I really thought you were going to say it was like published in 1982. Oh, that's horrible. Last ten years. Mm. <laughs> so uh, during all my research, I came across a study. Uh, from 2018, um, which I'll, I'll put into the show notes, from 2018, which found that uh, th- this this idea that there's no th- theory of mind for autistic people has completely pervaded thousands, and I mean thousands, of psycholo- psychology articles. In fact, they found that over 75% of the top 500 articles indexed by Google Scholar for theory of the mind and autism just reassert that autistic people lack a theory of the mind but completely fail to provide any original data to back up that claim. So I, I guess part of the conversation we should have tonight is where does this claim even come from? And there's a few people, but suspect number one, certainly for me and the, the papers I've read so far, is a British psychologist who, who some of you may be familiar with, uh, a, a person by the name of Simon Baron Cohen. Who is the cousin of Borat and Ali G's Sasha Baron Cohen. Um, so yeah, so as as you were just saying, Marianne, a lot of his um, his claim is is basically based on basically based. There's far too many bees there. Um, is is basically based on uh, autistic children's performance on a theory of the mind task called false belief. Now, I think Matt, can you explain false belief to us? Yeah, I think it's um, so. In a false belief task. A child might be introduced to two puppets, one named Bert and the other named Ernie. The child watches as Bert places a sweet inside a box. Then Bert is taken away and Ernie moves the sweet from its box to another location, such as in a cupboard. When Bert comes back, the child is asked, 
where will Bert look for his sweet? If the child answers with the location where the sweet actually is, rather than the box where the first puppet placed the sweet, the child is considered to have failed the false belief task and to lack a theory of mind. So has anyone ever experienced this or, or heard of it anywhere else? I've heard of, um, I think it was called something else. It had a girl's name, like Sally or some other sort of female name. But yeah, that's where I've heard it in the context of autism tests. But I got diagnosed using a slightly different method that wasn't towards children. It, it feels like it's much of a muchness with the um, famous marshmallow test, which is about, you know, ability to kind of restrain oneself from, from taking a... a did I say marshmallow? Yes, I said marshmallow. Said marshmallow. Restrain oneself from uh, eating a uh, marshmallow. And apparently that's been uh, shown itself to be incredibly unreplicable. Um, I also remember a version of this, uh, this false belief task, uh, being included in the book, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, uh, a book by Mark Cadden, who, who is an autistic, um, which I do remember when I was at school in the 2000s was taken as a very much a genuine portrayal of autistic experiences. Um, but in retrospect, quite a lot of it felt very much taken almost directly from academic and other writing and like popular writing on autism. Um, and suffice to say, it's, uh, it's aged um, it's aged poorly, you might be surprised to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt? This reminds me of Schrodinger's cat. It's all a thing about if this isn't there, where is it? It's all very confusing to me. It's also the, it's also the kind of thing where it feels like the explanation of what the task is is very simple but I suspect how it's actually done in practice, the devil's in the detail. Well, um, as we'll come but... on to later, the, a lot of the problem is uh, repeating these tasks has often led to uh, less than brilliant repeated results. Um, and as any scient scientists amongst you will know, the true test of any good experiment is one that can be repeated. I mean, we, we did a bit of research into sort of false belief tests, and I actually found some quite revealing data, which boiled down to actually a lot of children get the false belief test wrong. Those with language impairments or Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, epilepsy. Fundamentally, the more atypical a child, the more likely they are to fail false belief tasks. And, you know, we love atypical people on this podcast. We wouldn't exist uh, if we weren't atypical. But one of the things which we sort of looked at a bit more was it wasn't just those with, with a neurodivergent uh, brain who were failing these tests. Kids whose parents smoked at home or had fewer siblings or just came from a lower socioeconomic background were more likely to fail a false belief test. So that kind of feeds into what you were just saying there is the way in which these tests were managed and deployed, it could, could have done more about the, the outcomes than the test itself. Yeah, it, it kind of feels like that kind of test. I mentioned a bit earlier about the kind of cultural side of things. It, it feels like the kind of test that you could fail for reasons that show you, that might still indicate you have a theory of mind, just you're not using it in that context. So, you know, to be frank, if you're seeing through the whole, the whole activity, if you're kind of, you get what's happening, but you don't want to engage with it, you might see the point of it and just go, well, I'm not taking this seriously. It's just, I'm just being kind of played around with by a psychologist. Or alternatively, you might base a lot, especially if you've because of being autistic, maybe you've have had less experience kind of making friends or, you know, you found yourself pushed away. You might actually be thinking more about things like narratives where often characters do, especially in children's fiction or children's programs, often have knowledge they shouldn't really have for narrative reasons, just because it keeps things flowing along. Um, and that means that, you know, you might go, yeah, I know that in reality, Bert might not have that knowledge, but in this context, I think they will because it would, it would slow a story. I, I could see a range of reasons why you might give the answer, which if you were asked a clearer question, you wouldn't give. Yeah, absolutely. Marianne? Um, yeah, so I guess the thing is with us, or sometimes autistic people, is we struggle to sort of jump in on a conversation while it's still relevant. And sort of funny enough, I was going to say, I remember when we did the curious incident of the dog in the night time, and I was 12, I was told by our English teacher that autistic people don't have any empathy and cannot feel any love or any sort of warm feelings towards other people. And this is what my school was teaching about autistic people um, in around 2005 or so. So, yeah. Oh, God. yeah. So I didn't know I was back then. So I, I sort of just took her word as, okay, so that's what they're like then. Because I didn't know I was one of them until, until I got older. 
it's it's a shame as in some ways it's quite a sweet book and it's a nice little tale but it, it's it's that kind of thing where it's used beyond what it was intended for and it and it and i think i think mark haddon's distanced himself from me i don't think he ever says autistic specifically yeah i do like the fact that the boy is sort of ha- he has like you know meltdowns or that sort of overloading a lot of information and stuff like that he sometimes he just feels confused by that i can relate to that i think it is it's not a necessarily negative thing, but yeah, the way that it was taught in schools about autistic people basically having no feelings is just really strange. Matt? Just want to point out that The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime was published way after I went to school. We never did anything exciting like this. I don't I see, I don't think we did it at school. I think it was the kind of more standard recommendation of a book. So when I say it was around when I was at school, I mean more like if someone was recommending autistic books, it was the kind of thing they'd recommend to a parent or recommend to an autistic um, autistic child who'd just been diagnosed, trying to understand about themselves. Or that was just kind of, it, in some ways, it was, the, it, was the two, it was the 2000s rainbow. Yeah, we read about it in class all as a group, and we all sort of sat there while the teacher read it. Um, so it was sort of compulsory for us to read that particular book. This was when um, oh. this was in probably the year eight curriculum in, you know, the place I was born. But I mean, or, it, it, it um, was published in two thousand three, so yeah, it's, it's about the right time for, for yeah for at least three of us to have been at at, at school. Um, did, one, did of the, it, one of the things didn't I did, it you know, win some kind book, of award or something? That's possibly why more people yeah. read it. Was it a, like a Booker Prize I, or something? I, I think it ran. I think it ran the Man Booker Prize. Yeah, I, I, I remember. I think that's probably what made it so prominent. Uh, I, it's a, it's a shame because it's a book in some ways that I really like for its kind of unconventional attempts. We we probably have to have a topic on this, I think, at some point. But yeah, uh, it's a book I like for its kind of unconventional approach to. Uh, how it uses the text so there are bits where the text breaks apart because of the overload and you start seeing like i mean i mean i'm a trained fan massively you start seeing like the proper uh, rail alphabet font used to render all the signs and the and, and it's this it's this great it's a great way of illustrating that sense of i am overloaded i'm not really taking stuff in or reading it properly all these signs are in front of me and i feel daunted in this context so there are some bits that are really like good for that and where i've got a bit of a fondness for it for that reason but i I don't like what it made people think about autism it's the same as stuff like rain man and so on the curious incident won the whitbread book awards for best novel and book of the year the commonwealth writers prize for best first book and the guardian children's fiction prize ah well there you go so yes so that's probably why it became quite well known um yeah so I, i to an extent i i I actually do blame um, Baron Cohen for some of this. And I, I'm sorry, I'm going to quote him again. So hold on to your socks. Uh, he actually said, mind blindness is universal in applying to all individuals on the autistic spectrum. I, 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 I mean, like, it, it, the thing is, that's an incredible statement to make in general in any scientific field. The phrase "the phrase is universal" is an incredibly brave statement to make as a scientist. It does make me slightly question the uh, quality of your scientific so, so analysis. Hold, hold on to your anger because he gets worse. He says, uh, "He says that autistic people are biologically set apart from the rest of humanity in lacking the basic machinery." Of theory for the mind. Wow, that's really alienating. That language. Uh, an extremely normal comment for someone to make when they're claiming that other people don't have empathy. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? Because yes. that person sounds like they're not having much towards what we might be thinking. Uh, it, it, um, it 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 does. Uh, talking about humans as machines also has a, a rather unfortunate historical connotation. Uh, oh God. Okay. Yes. Right. So, as we said before, this this belief has permeated psychology for at least 30 or 40 years. And and despite there actually being several really good studies, which I've found, and attempts to correct it over the years, I think we do still struggle with this with professionals today. So uh, I, I certainly know it has impacted on a lot of people trying to get diagnoses of autism being told oh, no, you're, you're far too good at talking to people. You've got a theory of the mind, therefore you can't be autistic. 
I, I'm sure we can all tell our own horror stories of of uh, things like this and people we know and, and our our own um, versions of it. Uh, and I do think that actually we could have an entire episode on on diagnoses because I know a lot of people have had it uh, in later life and, and some of the issues with getting that. Anyway, so back to theory of mind. So uh, I, like I said before, I mean, all, all good scientists know that if you can't replicate a finding, it probably wasn't true to begin with. And guess what? A lot of the research done by Baron Cohen and his friends, very, very difficult to replicate the outcomes. So that immediately to me, with as someone with, you know, a whole A level in, in a science, says, I, I, I'm questioning the methodology here. I'm questioning how they wrote it up. I'm questioning ev- all of the things they brought out of it and the huge assumptions. Because it feels a little bit like they just made up their minds that this is what it must be like. And therefore, they went to try to, to find, to, to manufacture data to support that. Yeah. Cherry picking. Um, what we're sort of t- told as you know a level students back in when we did it what we were told not to do with our studies they must be you know double blinded you know big fair sample diverse sample correlation not causation all that sort of stuff yeah exactly and and this is kind of my point is that if theory of the mind's tasks are are truly there to assess the ability to i guess to infer other people's intentions, their their goals, their their desires, and therefore, if autistic people lack that theory of the mind, then really we should be really bad at inferring other people's intentions and stuff. But there are loads of studies that show the opposite, and I am pretty sure we can all talk about being able to work out what others want. I mean, ish. Given context of when you're in a situation, you've got an idea about roughly the kind of thing somebody might come back with you if the conversation is flowing and you're talking about a particular subject you've you've got a rough idea where it's going but if it's all from the outset it could be anything really and you you're not prepared for whatever's coming because it could be literally anything yeah absolutely so i just sort of slightly lost track where i was in the chat king because i was just making a note of what my joke was there um i mean you getting lost in the chat yeah. and talking about what you need to be doing honestly it's this. This is almost like you're. We're we're all autistic and ADHD and trying to, to stay on track with a thing. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yes. My, my joke for an explanation was that you. Can, uh, we find it pretty hard to work out. Well, I was one. Well, I mean, I, I, yes. I actually had it originally, and I wanted to have a really long pause and be like, "I'm sorry, do you want us to talk now?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I didn't. I didn't get anything either. I think the I problem. Well. Um, the problem with you know human interactions, just with any humans. I mean. Obviously, I'm not a neurotypical, so. But I think it would be very helpful if people sort of spelled out their um, intentions. So, like, hello, I would like you know this from you, or that sort of thing, or hello, you have accidentally offended me by doing this. Can you please apologize? Or just that sort of approach to communication, rather than what some people do, like they might sulk or something like that. Um, and they say, oh, you know what's wrong. And then the other person will say, I absolutely do not. That's that whole thing that some people have. Me? Yeah, I, I think that sounded so funny. Uh-huh. Sorry, yeah. yeah, I think, um, have you ever had those moments where you feel like someone isn't happy with you or you feel like something's going on, that they're saying things are fine or they're saying that, you know, actually the issue they're pointing out is something very minor. And then later on down the line, you realise actually, no, they were meaning that. I think sometimes that's what happens with this element. It's just where actually we are sometimes quite good at reading, but other people are very much trying to disguise what's actually going on. Um, or you can really you can really just run into a problem where, you know, it's those very culturally specific things. Some people do not say things very frankly um, or do not want to say things openly. When you're autistic, you can, you can either be in the position where you just don't understand what they want, or you can be in the position where... You do understand what they want, but you're trying to work out the best way of not of kind of masking another thing or part for another episode and kind of looking normal in that scenario or whatever normal is, um, well, which can be a real normal challenge. Normal is just so, the average so, of everyone's oddities, surely. Yeah, but you, you know what I mean? I think we all have a sense of what we're trying to do in those circumstances. I, I guess maybe turn around normal and just say essentially not to be found out 
if, if we have a fear, you know, a fear of being found out, uh, of being autistic or what in that situation, which as someone who hasn't given their name yet in this podcast, uh, that obviously isn't something that applies at all to me. No, of course not. We don't know who you are. You've just jumped into this server. I'm most distressed. You, you, you very much upset me. Um, Wait, someone's I upset? Actually, uh, I know. I, uh, and you know about that. Uh, this feels like an excellent segue into empathy. Oh, yeah, because if you were upset, I would be thinking, oh, no, why are you upset? What's happened? How can I help or how can we help? This is bad. How can we make this better? That might be sort of what I would think, I, mean, that, I that, guess. That sounds kind of right. But do autistic people have empathy? I think we can have too much. I know that sounds incredibly like incredibly saccharine in some ways. But I think there's definitely can be circumstances where you put yourselves into the shoes of people and it can become overwhelming because in reality, a lot of people's coping strategies to day-to-day life is that they pick very cautious, carefully who they have empathy for. And to some extent, that's not, not a bad coping strategy in some ways. You, you, as demonstrated, you'd sometimes like struggle to get by in day-to-day life without that. I think, I think um, most typical people do the same, that, though, don't that, they? Yeah. But you, can, you, could, you could essentially run into a problem where you, you, you essentially just you empathize people to the point where you kind of play down yourself and you play down what what you want and need in a particular situation um you know you, you you don't you don't go for a job because you worry about upsetting that person who's also going for it but maybe the reverse isn't true or maybe the reverse is true they are worried about upsetting that they also are willing to put their own interests first because they understand that that's just how things are um i think i think you can get that kind of situation quite a lot um when you're autistic what do you think, Matt? Um, I I'm having to look up empathy in a dictionary, um, because when I was employed, one of the things I had to do was to consider everybody's um, aspect on certain things. Uh, the the old autistic thing of um, making sure absolutely every uh, angle is covered. I think I covered this la- in the last podcast that. Um, uh, you've got <laughs> consider a scenario, make sure absolutely every outcome is considered. And is that not roughly what empathy is going on, where you try to get the how everybody else would react to this? That makes sense. It, I, I, I don't, for me, I feel like I would do that in part because of fear of what would happen if I didn't, because of a fear of what consequences will come if I don't think about everyone involved. Yeah, I, I, maybe a fear of consequence, maybe just also just a general attention to detail being like, oh, I don't want to miss anything. If you've got that attention to detail, it might be because you're afraid of what will happen if you don't account for everyone. It might alternatively be an empathy in its own regard that you're, you've been on the other end of being forgotten by someone who is organising something or who should have taken account of your, your needs and you don't want to do the same because it, it's hurt to do that. And so you think, well this upset me when this happened in the past. I don't want to do this to others. But it could also just be a kind of general sense of like, I like having attention to detail. You, you like being across all, all the elements. And yeah, I think it could be a bit of a mix. It's that kind of mix of fear, past experiences, and just a general wanting to make sure you're on top of things. Um, what, what do you think? What do you think of that, Matt? It's about considering how people are going to react to to whatever it is that you're planning to change. and. Yes, based upon my experiences, because in most of the time you can't really suggest what people are going to be thinking. Uh, this is uh, there's two there's oh dear there's so much so much of a minefield going on. Um, when you're with somebody and you're face to face, I would presume that you would have a better chance of finding out what they're uh, getting some empathy from them because of the way they behave and and again back to seating positions and body language but if you're considering people's reactions to the world and you making a change in it then there's it could be anything you um you can only base it upon what you know so yes based upon personal experience that's what i do but also um people sharing experiences people telling you things like oh you know well i did this this and this and just like, all oh, right yeah i need to consider that as well but i don't know about x y and z because they are unknown yeah so yeah, i think yeah that makes sense sorry marion go ahead sorry i've had my hand up um 
But yeah, I think I was going to agree with the fact that sometimes we do have so much empathy. And I think what you said about, you know, trying to make sure other people don't feel the way we have. I think I have a strong sort of feeling about that because the, the amount of times that, you know, we have been ignored or the amount of times in some any context, a work context, a social context, where I just sit there and nobody sort of acknowledges my existence. It makes me then, when I'm doing the opposite with, you know, when I'm doing stuff that is social or work-based, I always try and thank people that have done work. I always try and say, oh, you did really good and that sort of thing to other people so that they feel good about themselves because I know what it feels like to be a human just trying your best. And I think some of us have so much empathy towards other things like protected characteristics as well. Like, for example, a lot of us are very um, strongly involved in being allies of other causes. And, you know, we sort of, when we see that level of discrimination for other protected characteristics, it can make us really angry as well. Um, because we sort oh, of. 100%. We, yeah, we, we are exactly. absolutely a, a, a pro trans, pro LGBT, pro people podcast yeah anti-racism anti-homophobia and anti anti basically being a poo i guess anti-discrimination what do you think me uh so so, so it's funny because i feel like i've had this a lot of experience lately with, with stuff at work where i think maybe what we can separate here is the idea of if kind of that theory of mind thing which is not getting that other people have minds and have thoughts their own and the difficulty in reading people which I don't think is necessarily just an autistic thing, but again, coming back to that cultural thing can be affected by it. I've had lots of meetings lately where I've, I've had to get an opinion of, of people who generally have, this is fine, this fine, anonymous on these, generally have kind of maybe a slightly like flat slash grumpy affect. And I don't mean in terms of an autistic way, I mean in terms of like, this is their serious day at work and they are taking it seriously. And frankly, it, it, I don't know what it comes from. And that's what's concerning because you're, you have that reaction of, is it because what I'm presenting you, you think it's crap and you just don't want to say because you don't want to voice that openly, you're just trying to be polite? Is it that uh, this is just how you are today? Is it just this is how you are in general? It can be really hard to know and read people in those contexts. I mean, especially when you're doing it remotely. It isn't the same as not having empathy. Because often, if I, if I learn, oh, the reason why you're feeling like this is because you, you're worn down by work or you've been dealing with a lot of personal things, or just like, you know, you, you've you been enthusiastic in the past, you've kind of had that beaten out of you a bit because it just hasn't gone anywhere. And that's why you're now maybe not particularly engaging with, you know, when you give someone an idea, they're not taking it and running with it. We, I think we've all had that kind of meeting where we're trying to kind of be the optimistic or interested one. And we find our people just, it just sort of lands with just a damp squib. And in that context, I could be like, actually, I have a lot of empathy for that. You know, I, I can see all that must be quite difficult, but I have nothing to read in there, you know. And I think some of that is culturally specific because you could put me, you could put those people in another culture, people who are perfect at reading others in some cultures, and they'd constantly blunder because they would just read signals that weren't there. It's like when people think animals are smiling, they're often not smiling. It's just they have another expression that looks like it, but people can misread it. But like some of it is also just, it, it can be very difficult to read, especially when you feel like the stakes are higher, when, when you feel like maybe you don't already belong in a space put that one down another topic belonging mm. when you don't really feel like you belong in a space and uh you want to uh <laughs> you just feel like you're you're not being particularly accepted by those there and that can be quite disconcerting and you could be trying to desperately trying to understand what someone wants and trying to empathize in order to kind of fit back in um without kind of showing you know essentially as i've noted giving away that you're autistic Yes, and, and, or giving and I think away we, a weakness that it might be used against you. We did sort of touch on on some of this uh, in the last episode, where where Matt was telling us about the experience of being in meetings and trying to give people data. Oh, remind me. Being in meetings, and um, because you didn't look right or speak in the right way, people weren't interested in hearing your information. Uh, yes, or or I think more to the point, you don't get a chance to get in. Um, yeah, data. Um, you're not, you can't, oh dear, you can't explain yourself enough into them. You can, you can give them the raw data and it comes off, sort of, uh, it rolls off the tongue as if, oh, and this did this and this did that. But I don't really know how you present data for everybody else because, again, it's, 
trying to get them to understand it relies upon knowing how they would interpret the data themselves. Um, I'm going to haul us back a little bit uh, because I, I do think we need to slightly sort of set out our stall a bit. As we've discussed before, and, and, and I know we this has come up in other conversations that, that we've had elsewhere, uh, we do know that there's a bit of a a dominant theoretical model of autism that has long centred on this sort of assumed autistic lack of empathy. So, again, going back to a lot of the reading that uh, that I've done this this last few weeks, um, it does look like a lot of the research has largely relied on these sort of cognitive tests that lack a real world connection, and the information that you get from that, and so. Uh, for me, I guess it's that artificial separation of thought and feeling, which then fails to properly understand how we how we feel things, uh, how we perceive them, and and so arguably that places more socially shy people at a at a bit of a disadvantage. I mean, uh, how how can we be told we have a lack of empathy when we're lacking that critical real world information that we receive inwards when we have a, a an in person conversation? Yeah, I think I think some of this is it, particularly those artificial environments. So, so you know, it's one thing showing empathy for someone you feel quite relaxed around and uh, who kind of accepts you, and you know, you, you feel like you can be yourself with. But it's another going into a context like a kind of lab setting or a research setting where you you've just met someone, uh, especially if you're a child, you're probably quite intimidated by that context, and you're kind of whether you're a child or an adult, you kind of feel like you're having to perform in some way. Or that there's some expectation of you that you don't fully understand, and that that's quite unnerving, and that that means you you might perform in ways that affect the studies that are actually related to your kind of actually having empathy. You know, it's not observing you in reality; it's just kind of, I guess, the concept of observed preference versus a uh, revealed preference. It, it's kind of really focused around like what what you say you'll do in a context like a lab or what you seem to do in a lab, but not actually what you actually might do in reality when you're dealing with real people. Yeah. So I'm going to do another quote. Do, do please, you know, hold back your, your aggro. So I'm going to quote from uh, Fletcher and Watson, uh, which is a 2019 study. Again, I'll link these in the show notes. There is currently no agreed consensus for defining autism as a concept. However, the term generally refers to a form of human neurocognition that is developmental in nature and which results in divergent sociocognitive processing styles. While there is an increasing move towards understanding autistic people through explorations of their nuanced human experiences, which is effectively the social model, that's me editorialising, the medical model of disability continues to largely dominate how society thinks about autism and autistic people. Now, I think that there is a bit of a danger in allowing the medical model to still be the, the dominant one, the one that's accepted. Um, I, I just quoted there about this. There's a thing called the social model of disability. Um, I think, Marianne, you're probably best place of all of us to explain this one. Um, thank you. Um, well, I guess the social model is sort of looking at disability as a sort of concept where society can work together to remove the barriers that someone faces. Like, for example, a person who requires a wheelchair to get around, the barrier might be, you know, traveling from A to B. And how can we remove those barriers would be to, you know, install ramps in sure a really seamless travel experience and all that and so for an autistic person it might be you know clear communication that isn't sort of you know wiggling your left finger to hint that you mean something that you haven't said or just being clear upfront respectful and um, not very judgmental I think so rather than what is the opposite which is the medical model is looking at a person and saying "Ooh, something's wrong with that person something's wrong with them uh, they've got this thing or they've got that thing and it's on them it should be on them to sort themselves out because they're you know they're different we'll just carry along and we'll just call them names or just diagnose them with things or whatever not not quite like that maybe cut that bit but um, sort of not being as accepting or understanding and advocating for people. Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, I guess if you sum it up, I'm really sure it'd be the medical model is about adapting the person to the society. The social model is about adapting the society 
to meet the person's capabilities. Um, some some time ago, I became a member of the Institute of Leadership and Management. I, I, um, I managed to get onto a course, and during it, they taught that there's a third model, a third model, and that's a hybrid of social and medical. Um, now, I don't have any data with me about what that model looks like, but um, I'll dig that out and share a, a link with you, Simon, later on for you to uh, include, because that's it was rather interesting. I, I had never heard of it before. No, that'd be... Yes, no, please it, do and, and share it with us and I'll put it in the show notes. Is it by any chance called the capability model? Because... I remember at university, we talked at one point about Amartya Sen and his capability model, which was about, essentially, it's about how, it's like, extent, it's kind of slightly different to the kind of medical and social model, because it kind of combines both by saying that it's about a person's capabilities and how society interacts with them. And the capabilities, especially in that case, are taken very broadly, because you can also, you know, other than applying it to kind of a person's impairments, you can also apply it to people's socioeconomic status, um, their race, their uh, their sexuality, their gender presentation, and how that, that interacts with the way society is organised to affect what people can do, affect their ability to do, and, and this is a very academic way of putting it, their, uh, their ability to achieve valued functionings, if whoever rightly was the term. Valued and, um, functionings. You know, that's, you, you, that's, a, yeah. that's a euphemism if ever I heard one. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. You can sort of think about, like, if you don't own a car and you live in a world that is designed around owning a car, you're really going to struggle. If you live in a world that is designed around it, you're not really if you're designed around not owning a car. So if you live in a world that's designed around not owning a car, you're not really that affected by not owning one. You know, you might have some little benefits you lose out on, but ultimately you're probably going to have quite an easy time. Indeed, owning a car might actually be an issue. And, you know, you can see that in societies like the Netherlands where they've kind of reorganised a lot of their their system around making it easy to walk and cycle and compare that to somewhere like uh, parts of the US and Canada, which are incredibly hard to walk anywhere and where it's incredibly difficult to achieve a lot of day-to-day -day things without the expense and the ability to drive a car. And actually, you could you could essentially be at a greater risk by not owning one, like you could be at greater risk of traffic accidents and so on. So that, so that capability model is about bridging those two. It's about going, yes, there are things about the person which can, can interact with that society, but trying to avoid maybe more like the medical model, which just has a sense of and the only thing ever worth fixing is the person. And if you have an issue, it's because you're flawed. There is a normative society you need to fit within. And uh, if you don't, well, then that's kind of your problem. Uh, here's, here's some uh, pills. Hopefully they work. Hopefully they, hopefully they, hopefully they bring your meltdowns under control and stop you being unable to fit in normally. Hopefully they. That yeah. description you a problem. gave of a capability model sounds to be uh, the reason why equality impacts assessments are, uh, take place. That seems to be. Um, you mentioned other characteristics there under the EA, um, and. That sounds like what the basis of equality impact assessments are for. Yeah, yeah, because it, it, it kind of reflects back on that quite a lot. Um, the capability approach, I, I call it the capability model, it's actually called the capability approach. And it's also a lot about like how you define freedom, your freedom and ability to do things, and about moving away from, about understanding all that you need to actually enable your ability to choose what you want to do and to do the things you want to do and to have access to those opportunities. Um, and I think lots of lots of society is one where if you're disabled, there's lots of barriers to you having the opportunities you want to have. Yeah, and, uh, and some of which are entirely surmountable, but are just held back by the fact that we just haven't built our society in that way. I think it's really interesting what 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 you and Matt just said about that because I mean it does seem that you know whilst these social and and I think you you called it hybrid uh, models are, are growing in use and popularity. I do think we're still often stuck with this medical model of autism, you know, the one which sort of focuses on that um, socio-communicative difficulty, the, the the repetitive behavioral patterns, restricted interests. This is starting to ring bells. What was it we were mm -hmm. talking about last time? Oh, yes, the repetitive interests with the consistent talk of football, constantly where I work as well. It's, oh, have you seen this? Have you seen that? And did you hear about this team's problem doing this or something like that? I did yeah. most of my work was in a mostly male oriented 
um, team would be very lucky to have any females in, in where I used to work. And if it wasn't about football, it was about women. So it was always yeah, uncomfortable. Um, um, and then there's this, um, uh, there's, there's the football bit about the, the, the beautiful game and the actual intricacies of the game, which is all very well, but then there's a kind of a macho side to it as well. There was always this feeling of testosterone in the, in the room, but it was always very uncomfortable. Football, football, football. I think, I think there can also be, a, you know, I, I don't want to go too far in saying that the people, you know, I think football is definitely a, a seen as a very accessible topic to start a conversation because I think in the UK context, it's assumed that most people have a teammate support or at least most men. But I think the problem that you run into is when the reaction of, when it's so difficult to say, I'm just not interested in that topic, or when like it's used as a way of like excluding others from a chat, or when it's kind of become such a dominant topic in conversation that it kind of puts you at a disadvantage, or where it's actively used as a thing of, oh, aren't they weird? They're not into this. Because uh, I, I think there's that kind of thing. You, you can have healthy and unhealthy obsessions. Yes. And I think some people have a slightly unhealthy approach to to them I, I think sometimes it's also like seen as a kind of conversation starter or an ability to like go oh you're into this team you must be like xyz where people try to square each other up on first meeting um i've, I've never liked football so i always struggle with that um right um yeah I can, uh, I, anyway so dragging back um so be- football, football, football. yeah I, I have no interest so because i suppose this dominant model is well just that um, uh, so much of the, the autism research that has been going on for years and years and years has has focused on what typical people think that autistic people lack. And it's, I guess, in this way that autistic people are positioned as being in need of um, fixing in order to align our behaviours with those which are typically expected within mainstream cultures. Yeah, we can probably add that to the list of uh, topics we need to do a whole episode on. Fixing and curing and uh, why aren't you just normal? Maybe that's what we should call it. I, why aren't, yes, that's an excellent episode title just there, yes. Um, I think we're going to have to do a whole episode on those people because I, I, I think we have a lot to say about the cures some of these organisations peddle and you know that the abuse, also known as ABA. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> as I was saying, uh, uh, consequences, yes, consequences um, of the medical view is that I guess that the autistic community have long kind of been denied agency in shaping our own narratives and influencing how, I guess, how we are viewed within society. I mean, it's part of why we started this podcast after all. But I guess, what do we think? I mean, do, do, do we think that the medical model has robbed us of, of agency and therefore we get mistreated for not conforming with what typical people think is normal? I think the challenge of being autistic is that there's quite a lot of groups in society, especially in recent years, who have really tried to recapture a narrative that has been taken for them for many years, usually taken by a dominant group in society. And there usually is also a massive pushback on this. <laughs> but there tends to be, I guess this wasn't the choice initially on some of them, so I don't want to speak too broadly on this, but you, you tend to have a situation where there isn't another group that's seen as necessarily having like the final say on what that group should be like. One of being autistic is that you run into an issue that a lot of people you speak with treat psychologists, psychiatrists, like kind of medical professionals, and actually maybe even less so that, but more what's been kind of brought into receive knowledge, what's been written over time, what people have heard over the years, what they've seen in films. They often treat that as just as influential as what an autistic person says, if not more. And we therefore often really struggle to kind of set an understanding of what autism is. And we really struggle to kind of like set have that agency to be able to say you know this is what we're like this is what we're looking for it can often be really hard to get out there in particular because you know coming back to this idea this is definitely not just unique to us um the forums through which we would share that knowledge are quite often built and designed for a certain type of person and often the impairments we have or the experiences we have make it very hard to engage with those forums or very hard to kind of be heard in those contexts. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's something which does also apply to, 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 to other people who are absolutely uh, sort of on the atypical uh, spectrum, if you will, um, especially across sort of the LGBTQ plus communities, I suspect. But I, I guess part of my, my, my worry about this sort of like the, the medical uh, sort of view that we, we lack that ability to, to empathise and to to, to have our own agency comes back to suspect number one once again so 
I, I had to go through a number of papers to understand something which he'd written about, which is called empathizing systemizing. And bear with me because there is some insane awfulness here. But essentially, it is a mix of that mind blindness that we talked about earlier. Um, and another of Baron Cohen's theories, which was called weak central coherence, which he believed to result in increased attention to fine detail and difficulties integrating information within a wider context. Basically, what he was saying is that autistic people are seen as problematic and incapable of uh, uh, what, what he saw as an assumed need within everyday social situations to quickly understand social information. Mm. There's a there's a thing there about filtering, isn't there? So quickly understanding social information, it's back to being blinded by signage and the like and deciding which one means which, where some of them can be ambiguous and working your way through. And all of that time that you've been thinking this, you are expected to come up with an answer within a split second. Yeah, it feels like this theory is kind of just saying that autistics are less empathic than non-autistic people. In some ways, it feels like a sort of attempt to rehabilitate what was probably started to become a bit discredited, maybe, of the idea that autistic people lack empathy by trying to like pin it to another theory, which it also had, and trying to kind of use that to kind of slightly smuggle the same idea through or, or kind of go, oh, damn, actually, some people had a good point on, on me not being right on that. But actually, I think it's linked into this bigger thing. And so that's how it gets by. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it kind of boils down to what, what they were thinking, or, or I should say what they said and reported, um, was that effectively, I suppose, autistic people process information in a uh, systematic way. They're systems thinkers. And that we're too rigid to be able to, to handle the spontaneity of everyday social or emotional uh, situations. Um, and, and that we just don't understand that empathy. And, and I think that apart from being complete and utter rubbish, it's kind of it's it's an attractive lie for the people who see us as a disease to be cured. So yeah, I, I think we've talked a bit before about the idea of a useful robot, and I think this kind of pins very closely into that idea. But if you're someone who is very good at processing stuff and kind of managing things systematically, but also you, you can't possibly understand empathy, it works very well with say recruiting campaigns, which tend to go things like, um, you know, I'm very good at managing kind of uh, like details and kind of being detail orientated and managing information. Um, I'm perfect to slot into your organization for someone who you need to, I don't know, manage a database or do filing. And that kind of goes, and this is what this person is good at, which both ignores that actually that person might not want to do that. It also ignores that that person might actually kind of prefer to do empathic jobs or might prefer to do other kinds of jobs that are more personable. Or they might actually not enjoy or be good at doing that systematizing. It, it feels like very much they're trying to say, like, this is what an autistic person is, and this is, therefore, this is all they can ever be, and this is what they're useful for. So the reason, you know, they're, they're essentially a robot. They're, they're a person who, like, this person is kind of, you shouldn't, frankly, you shouldn't consider fully human, or you shouldn't really consider, like, the full extent of that. And here's how, here's how they are useful. They're, they're kind of attention to detail, just slot them into your organization in that way. Um, which is quite a, a scary prospect, it, not least because of how often it's said even uncritically, even by people who are in theory allies or supporters who are trying to kind of make things better. Um, and, it, and it can be difficult to engage with. Yeah. No, it, I, because I, it looks like a compliment. Yes, absolutely. I, I think that's, uh, I think I made the point last, last week about identifying too much with Marvin the paranoid android. He's there for a very good reason. He does a good job and everyone just sort of doesn't really pay him that much attention. Not used yeah, to his um, full potential. No, indeed not. No. Um, so anyway, so as 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 part of I know you said our research, but you know my research, fine, whatever. Our research, we're 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 a sharing podcast. We're pro sharing. Um, so as part of five pounds. <laughs> so as part of our research, we found a uh, sort of an interesting concept on measuring empathy, because it's kind of hard to do that in like real life, isn't it? You you can't just sort of slap a meter down on a person and measure them out of ten for empathy. Um, it might be rather lovely if we could, but alas, we can't. If I think about like my friends, I know a few of them who are stupendously brilliant at the whole emotional intelligence thing um, uh, and the empathy bit, uh, who just can just tell instantly. And and I do I do sometimes wish I was better at it. Although having said that, I do have friends who I can just glance at and I know exactly what they're thinking and how they're feeling. But they're also neurodivergent, so I think maybe that we just have some kind of telepathy or something that's going on there 
yeah, sometimes you'll read something, and I wish I had this skill, and, and, and you'll be like, you so heartfeltly captured that. I've, I've tried to do it as much as I can, but occasionally you'll just see a fantastic bit of writing. Someone I know recently shared um, a rejection letter they got from a job, and it was just such a class thing. It wasn't, you're bad at this. It was actually, we thought you were really good. It's just, you're not quite at the level for this role. We're going to kind of keep you on file. Um, you know, we, we really enjoy talking to you. We think you're, you're really good at this. But it was also, it was like letting someone down, but it was doing it in a way that was just so like understood what that letter meant to that person. And that that letter could very easily make that person feel really bad because, you know, I went for this opportunity and I didn't get it. And, I'll, you know, I was really hoping and it just didn't work out. And I wish sometimes that I could do that. But I'm not sure that's an autistic thing. I think that's a broader thing. I think some people just have a real ability to kind of to kind of just get a sense of like what will work for someone, what what or how someone's going to feel when they send them an email or a letter or how someone is going to feel in that context and work on it. <coughs> Dear. <coughs> and work on it. I'm gonna have so much editing to do off this episode. I'm just <laughs> That's why I tried to pick up again and just finish that sentence. So much gin. Um, but yeah, so again, hauling us back. I like this, this hauling us back metaphor. I, I, you know, I'm going to end up with, with sort of metaphorical podcasting arms like a stevedore. Um, so what about a, a, a fiction? Have you ever read a book or watched a TV program and felt like connected with the characters, sort of able to feel their pain, getting upset about things happening to them? Uh, I mean... I, uh, certainly when I was younger, it's like I, I'd read a book and go, right, this character is now my personality for the next six months. Do, do you ever sort of feel empathy for uh, fictional characters? Yeah. I've also done that thing where you borrow how you talk quite substantially from how another person talks or from how someone talks in a book. It can sometimes lead to quite stilted language, you know, especially if you read or hear something at quite a formative age. And especially if at that point you're looking for ways to, well, mask. So, yeah, no, very much so. And what about you, Matt? Breakfast Club. Uh, um, the Breakfast Club was po particularly popular for the youth of my generation, and we all wanted to be John Bender. Yes, there's plenty of films where I um, empathise with people, and uh, I have always imagined myself to be Sherlock Holmes. He, he resonates with me very beautifully because he's an alien and a weirdo and... Um, everything he does is logical. I mean, Conan Doyle is supposed to be, isn't he? Isn't he supposed to be autistic? No, no tests around, of course, back in his day, but it is suggested, I think. I think we need to do an episode on diagnosing people historically and on the uh, the origins of autism, because that's that's, that's a heavy story. As, as I said at the beginning, we've got so many things to, to talk about on this and, and we're falling over ourselves to try and find more of them. Um, certainly, a, a, a book which I was reading recently was the uh, Murderbot series by Martha Wells. Um, and I know we've we've talked about how we don't want to call ourselves robots. Uh, Murderbot doesn't call themselves a robot either. Um, and uh, they, they, I, 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 they have so many sort of depictions of a fundamentally a slightly to my my reading of it and i'm i'm imposing my own my own personal readings on it of, of basically being slightly autistic and depressed and scared of people and not really wanting to have to do anything with them um it's uh, it's uh, well worth reading if you if you get a moment i, I do i do find it, it's very often that you'll be reading or especially watching something and something will happen to a character usually you know them dying or something like that and the strange thing is when you watch back and you just desperately don't want that to happen again, even though you know it's going to, because you really just kind of, particularly if you empathize with them a lot, you, you really are like, oh, that's a horrible thing to happen and I just hope it happens differently. Uh, you know, the, so much of fiction is based on almost getting what you want. So we've, we've, we've heard about Matt and, and Breakfast Club and we've heard about me and, and uh, his things. What about Marianne? Is there any sort of uh, fictional characters that you identify with, you empathize for? Uh, oh, goodness. Um, I guess so, of the varied and possibly controversial things that I've seen before on television, um, because I have a strange, well, not strange, I have a sense of humour, I guess, which is probably contrary to what a lot of professionals think about autistic people. Um, so I did see a psychologist, or psychiatrist once that said autistic people 
do not have any humour, so there's no way that you could be autistic. Uh, she interpreted jokes within the session, of which there were none, but um, it's, yeah, it's strange. But I have felt um, sort of, not connections, but like sort of thinking, oh, right, I really feel for that person having that thing going wrong or something like that. I guess if the story is good enough, Although some of the things, like, there's a program called Friends, which I absolutely have no interest in. There's that, that sort of overly social context just seems more boring than when there's sort of other bits that are more interesting going on, I think. Yes, that Friends. That, that famously uh, brilliant television program where they all manage to sort of not earn a huge amount of money and live in the world's biggest apartment in one of the most expensive cities in the world. But, you know... Let's not get into that. Some of that, some of that, to be fair, not not to defend it, was because of that's how rent control works. But yes, it was very much a <laughs> sort of reminds me. I think Seinfeld has the same thing, though. I think Seinfeld is the better show, where uh, Seinfeld is very much about what people in LA think living in New York is like because they drive everywhere. I mean, that just sounds horrific to me. But yeah. Anyway, so, oh, it's so good. Uh, how how do we assess? <laughs> so, <laughs> again, hauling Steve Adore arms. Um, how do we assess um, empathy? And, and there's been some interesting studies, which I, I, again, I'm going to talk about studies because, you know, I did the falling down the rabbit hole thing and using fiction to help set a, a baseline, if you will. And one of the ones that's been used recently is of mice and men. And they had a bunch of autistic and non-autistic people write daily diaries uh, and fill out interviews and, and so forth. Um, about how they felt about the book, the characters, and the story. And, and the idea from this is to start from, like I say, this sort of agreed baseline where everyone has the same information to work from and uh, I suppose effectively to, to, to work away and decide if they actually can, can feel empathy within the confines of that story. So, Mice and Men. Did anyone read this at school? I know it was quite a popular one. I, I had to do the one on the island with the children and everything else. But uh, no, I didn't do Mice and Men. Did anyone do Mice and Men at school? I did. I did, yeah. Yeah. Me too. Um, what do you, do you remember, remember of him, Matt? Well, the same with David Copperfield as well that I had to read, and we never did any Shakespeare, was that they always said, right, so what do you see between the lines? So I'm physically looking for something between the lines, but I, I never, I, I still to this day don't get what they're trying to say hidden amongst the meaning. I've had to have it explained over and over. And another one like that is The Great Gatsby about the alcoholism and everything that isn't being said. I never really understood it. I, I you know, I always look blank. What, you, what do you mean? There's something else written here. I, I don't understand. I've never really got that. So I think then that makes it quite an interesting yeah, book to choose because it's got that sort of weirdly complex exploration of of stigma and um, what's the term othering towards others, and even that sort of within groups of disabled characters and that whole intersectional identity thing. And I guess maybe that's why I identify with it a little bit because it it does describe a lot of neurodivergent experiences. Um, sorry, me, I I interrupted you. I think the I think the point about you make a really good point there because I think a huge bit in of mice and men is that no one wants to be there, and I think to some extent it's a book that's hard to really like understand without understanding that kind of broader cont context of the depression and the the dust storms and so on. And I think like yeah, it, it's it, it's an interesting story. It's a story that hasn't aged well. Let's put it that way, especially in its portrayal of intellectual disability. But it's a story that also like like a lot of that kind of. <laughs> the greater American novels is a kind of tragedy set in a situation where uh, essentially people are experiencing things underneath that they aren't able to talk about. Marianne. Yeah, I was going to say along the lines of the um, sort of portrayal of people with intellectual disabilities, but also I think disabilities in general that are, you know, sort of not visible or sometimes even the visible ones is that um, there's a thing in that film or and the book sorry um about where the man accidentally kills uh, i think rabbits and then a human or something like that accidentally but it sort of comes across like it could portray the fact that people are yeah spoiler alert that people with 
you know, those kind of disabilities could be potentially dangerous, when I think a, an important thing to note is that we're more likely, we as in, you know, neurodivergent or emotionally or um, developmentally, intellectually, sorry, developmentally or intellectually disabled people are more likely to be the victims of violence and bullying and those kind of things rather than the perpetrators, which is something that I think the media doesn't understand. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, I should probably add, um, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't read a book from the 1930s, um, there was a spoiler there. You'd be surprised I, how many of you young people haven't read the classic books that we were taught at school. Yeah. Go on, name another classic book that you were taught at school. Uh, I'd say, let's, what would we do? We did The Great Gatsby, we did Zed for Zachariah, because it was all nuclear war at the time in the 80s. Um, Never even heard of it. Uh, it's very good. Um, the uh, the TV, the, and they did a TV show as well, which was very good. Um, it's all post-apocalyptic Britain and th uh, and threads. But the, I'm 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 um, dive, uh, I'm moving away from the target here. It needs to reel me back in. Um, I'll, I'll reel you back in. We'll 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 do a, a book review episode, so uh, you can go back and read Zed for Zachariah, and you can then uh, review it for us. How about that? Just to do a, 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 an end bit on the, the point of uh, empathy, mm. I think the experience you can have when reading a book like My Man or really any watching any book or any fiction, and especially reading people's analysis of it, is that you can very quickly end up putting yourself into every single person's position. Now, to some extent, that's a mark of a well-written book, but sometimes that can also make it hard to engage with a book, especially if like, the book is actually trying to be relatively simple. Like, if you've ever had a, have had a series where like there's a really clear villain... And then, like, you read something on TV Tropes or somewhere that says, like, you know, have you considered what it's actually like, what, what actually might be driving this? Usually that's not what's planned because it's just a very simple series. But you can often very quickly come up with, a, actually, this is actually a really bad situation for them. Or, you know, you can actually put some explanation behind it. And actually, you know, if you see it in their shoes, they are in some horrible situation. Um, and then you're actually like, oh, God, I really empathize with that or really even sympathize. And and that, uh, that can be a very strange experience. Uh, I think you can sometimes have a scene where, everyone in the scene who's getting at each other or attacking each other or whatnot, and only one of them can come out of it, um, you wind up being like, I actually empathise with everyone here. And that reminds you a little bit of having a day-to-day -day life. So let me just finish by telling you about the, the study which was done. So I found one from last year done by the University of Liverpool where they used of mice and men, which is why we've just been talking about it. Um, so it showed that everyone who took part, and this is both uh, autistic and non-autistic people, uh, experienced times of being invested within the book, as well as times of struggling to become or remain invested. So a bit like you were just saying. So I've had a bit of a read of some of their diary responses. But anyway, so the study outcome said that, as, as like those of us on this podcast would expect, that there is a deep and complex range of uh, empathies which can be shown by the autistic participants. And in fact, they didn't show any specific empathy deficits when compared with non-autistic participants. A and reading the, the, the paper, there was even some potential suggestion that the autistic participants actually felt a greater level of empathy towards the characters and were able to explain it better than the non-autistic people reading that book. Um, so that go, kind of goes back to a point made earlier in, in, in the cast about perhaps feeling more empathy and, and perhaps then becoming overwhelmed by it. Um, so, yeah, I think I think we are sort of approaching that point where we need to sort of wrap up a little bit. What, what do we all think on empathy and theory of the mind? So I think sometimes the, the issue with theory of mind is it's a theory that has had all this salience over all these years and has kind of been so dug into discussion and it means that we spend most of our time effectively backfighting to try and get that out of medical, not even medical stuff, but like kind of just like popular writing on autism, medical and, uh, and research of writing on autism and so on. And that, you know, as you've shown earlier on, Simon, it is still so deeply laden into even studies done recently. I do think... It, <laughs> I do think, however, that kind of like broader cultural context is worth considering. And I don't think, I don't know how much this is something that really the research looks at. I think it comes back to how, how researchers think about autism and what autism is and what kind of they mean when they're talking about theory of mind. And that is, you know, I do, I do think that they, it can be hard to read others and that, but that doesn't come necessarily, that, that can come from being autistic, but it can also come from other contexts. 
And it's kind of that kind of thing that I think we need to talk about in another session, which is kind of the secondary impacts of being autistic. And I think in this case, it's that if you're autistic, you've probably had various things which have led to you not being embraced by your peers, but it's probably affected like your ability to make friendships. It's probably affected people probably judge, and we probably need to talk about this very quickly that you're autistic in certain contexts. And therefore, you've probably felt quite excluded. And some of those situations where other people were developing those abilities or were learning that cultural context aren't there. Now, you can also get this if you move to a new town or to a new school or you move to another country or you go to a new job in an organisation you don't feel that comfortable with. I, I think this is something that lots of people can have um, that makes it very hard to read others, especially if you know they're in such a different context. But I do think it's something where people are mistaking something that's a consequence of being autistic for something that is caused by being autistic. And I think that potentially plays into what researchers are looking for when they're developing projects like or research studies like the one we've been talking about today, where they're, you know, they have a kind of preconception of what autism is and then making a study that validates that. And they're not really thinking more broadly about like how being disabled interacts with society as a whole. Marianne, what do you think? Well, I think I agree with um, what that guy has just said, because we think sort of money and science and stuff would be better well spent on things that are positive, like, you know, how to make... Yeah, it sounds like it's a bit hard to articulate, but how to do the social model of disability, how to remove barriers for us, how to support us, and that sort of thing. What sort of support or focusing studies on what support helps children better in the way they feel when they're autistic or whatever. Like, oh, studies have shown that if you teach children this, then they come out more comfortably and they're more confident. That sort of thing is, I think, it's probably more important than, you know, autistic people don't have this or do have that and they are aliens and that sort of thing. There aren't many studies also that study how non-autistic people interact with autistic people usually the the object of study is the autistic person Mm. matt any final thoughts yeah i've got this big thing about uh, i find myself repeating myself uh, among other things in life is that too many people judge others by their own standards they don't think about the others so for it just one to pick an example is um British people may well turn their nose up at the culture of another country because they do something, I don't know, eat insects, for example. Um, They do that because they're full of protein and it's the only thing around and it's totally understandable. But we judge a paste upon, well, why aren't they eating roast beef and vegetables like a proper human would do? So it's very much uh, a problem of judging by other standards. So when you... um, regarding the empathy uh you'll get the uh, typicals who will then try and judge us by the way that they think whereas what we have to offer um in a roundabout way or in a delayed way can answer the question but to try and get us to do it immediately and, and have this idea about how people work uh, it is always from their side uh, we were talking earlier about uh, um, most of the study is done by uh, typical people about atypicals. So do, do we know of any studies that have taken place by autistic people about autistic people and, and ignored the, the um, neurotypicals? Uh, I have to admit... I, I, I started going a little bit blind when I was looking at all of these things, but it's, it's a brilliant question. I, I will find out, and if so, um, either I will insert something into the podcast here or you'll find it in the show notes. But um, it might it might take me a few weeks to actually find that out because, of course, not all researchers disclose it either for the very fact that they don't necessarily want to have their data to be called up by the suspect number one, et al., um, as oh, you can't have an autistic person researching autistic people. They will, they will, you know, flump up the research. Um, but I'll, I'll look into it because you make a, a really, really very valid point. There is that it's very difficult to have typical people researching atypical people simply because their own brains will not allow them to to see us for who we are. Um, and as as indeed other people have made the point, that connection between 
uh, atypical and typical people is often the thing that causes that the problem. The communication issues are rare between us, but are every day between typical people. So some some brilliant points, and, and thank you everyone for uh, for this evening. I think I, I'm going to summarise it with we do have a theory of mind, and we do have empathy. Um, and the theory is that it's bad. Our, yes, well, our, our theory is absolutely <laughs> that uh, people on theory of mind. It is indeed bad. I'm not sure if it should be banned. I think mind perhaps it needs. Well, minds, yes, my mind should definitely be banned because it's it's at that point in the evening where I'm starting to think about beer and gin and not always in different glasses um so i think i'm gonna sort of wrap it up there I- i'm gonna say thank you to to my co-hosts uh matt thank you very much and marianne thank you very much and the mysterious voice bye bye um if everybody and if thanks. anybody wants to find more of anyone uh do they have anywhere they can go to I do some railway videos on YouTube. You can find me by searching for Beaching's Ghosts. I'll pop a link into the show description. I'm a relatively private person and don't usually do much social media, but I have one or two where I just mostly post pictures of... Very, very rarely post pictures of things like my 1920s to 19... 80s or whatever shoe collection or pictures of other people have taken of me with my head removed or stickers over my face and you can follow me on twitter if we can find you oh yes we can't that was the giant (laughs) we've we've had the a team on all day and we haven't realized it bloody murdoch sneaking in here honestly or is it face i can never quite i don't get that reference i do know the a team i don't i've never watched it (laughs) We're going to have so many references in this. It's it's just anyway, yeah. We're going to get told really off. Friends. It's just be, it's all in jokes and a few out jokes. Um, it's called a podcast. So yeah. So thank you everyone for joining us this week. Uh, next time on episode three, we're going to be talking about imposter syndrome and riffing on that for a bit. I'm hoping we can get another guest along as well. So I'm not sure again, if I can contribute to, to that one. Sorry. No, no, you don't. Okay. You you really you have nothing to add to that one because we don't even know who you are. So. You're just yeah, an, imposter. an imposter. You are, yeah. Um, so with that, uh, apart from passing along my congratulations to the Amazon workers in JFK 8 who have managed to unionise today despite Woo! an awful lot of uh, pressure. We are a pro-union podcast. We're pro many things, but pro-union, obviously. Hashtag join a union. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for bearing with us. We look forward to speaking to you again in episode three on imposter syndrome. And uh, that's it from me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.